Welcome to episode 75 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger over at sellingyourscreenplay.com. Today I'm interviewing Julie's Ona and Myron Tiruchelum. They just wrote a film called The Girl Is In Trouble starring Columbus Short and Wilmer Vladarama. We talk in detail about how they got this film produced, including how they got Spike Lee involved as an executive producer. So stay tuned for that. If you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking it on Facebook. These social media shares really do help spread the word about the podcast, so they're very much appreciated. Any websites or links that I mention in the podcast can be found on the blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcast. And then just look for episode number 75. If you want my free guide, how to sell a screenplay in five weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in your email address and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks, along with a bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide, how to write a professional logline and query letter, how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. Also, a quick plug for the new SYS Screenwriting Analysis Service. It's a really economical way to get a high quality professional evaluation of your screenplay. All the readers have experience reading for studios, production companies, agencies, or contests. The readers I've partnered with are the gatekeepers of the industry. They're exactly the same people who are going to be reading your scripts at the companies that you submit to. The readers will evaluate your script on several key factors like concept and premise, structure, character, dialogue, and marketability. Every script will get a grade of pass, consider, or recommend. And I'm also offering a bonus. If you get a recommend from, from a reader, you get a free email and fax blast to my list of industry contacts. This is the exact same blast service I use myself to promote my own scripts, and it's the same service I sell on the website. It's a great way to get your script into the hands of producers who are looking to make movies. Also on the website, you can read a quick bio on each reader and pick the one who you think would be the best reader for your screenplay. In the past week, I've rolled out a whole host of new services that go along with the script analysis product. I now have a television and television script option, either a 30 page or 60 page teleplay. And I've added a proofreading service as well. So if you don't want an analysis, but would like someone to proofread your script, we offer that now as well. So if you want a professional evaluation of your screenplay at a very reasonable price, check out www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. So now let's get into the main segment. Today I'm interviewing Julius Ona and Myron Tiru Chilvelm. Here is the interview. Welcome Julius and Myron to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks so much for having us. So maybe to start out, you guys can just give us a quick overview of your careers, how you got started in the entertainment industry, and um, kind of got to where you are today. Um, Myron, why don't you go ahead and start? Well, um, where did I get? How did I get to where I am today? Uh, I started out uh, working in, as a community organizer for many years uh, before I became a filmmaker, and I was always interested in film and telling stories, and so. Um, I decided to go to grad school for film, and I went to Columbia University. And since then, I've been making independent films. I make a couple films a year. And I was very lucky. Julius and I have known each other since college, uh, that he asked me to work on the film with him. And he was at NYU, and I was at Columbia, and we teamed up. It was kind of a great uptown, downtown collaboration. Perfect, perfect. So, Julius, maybe you could just um, give us a quick overview of your career. Yeah, well, my career starts with my Aaron Turch album. What he didn't mention is that my first real short film that um, ever played at any festivals that I directed was produced by him, and we worked together many, many years ago when we were uh, quite young men uh, in college and had continued to stay in touch. Uh, my Aaron actually got me my first job in New York at Kim's Video Store uh, right by Columbia. So we've always had a passion for film. We've always had a passion for social issues, 
And we've always been interested in trying to bring both of those passions together. Um, I knew I wanted to make films from a very, very early age. And, uh, you know, going to college was an opportunity to get a foothold into that. I'd interned for Spike Lee when I was quite young at, at the age of 19. And ultimately, when I went back to graduate school at NYU, I reconnected with Spike. Um, and I had an idea of making a film that was a noir. And the first person I called up to work with on it was my urn, and very luckily he agreed to work with me. So we started putting the film together, and we wrote the film together, and he produced it, and I directed it. And uh, that that film was both of our first leaps into professional filmmaking. Hmm. Okay, okay, great. So on IMDb, I, I noticed over the last 10 years, you guys have done a bunch of shorts. And that's one of the things I always recommend, especially for newer screenwriters. It's like, just if you, you go and make some shorts, team up with some directors, and maybe you can just kind of briefly comment on that. You know, what did you do with these shorts? Did you send them to festivals? What kind of success did you have? Um, kind of how did that help your careers? Short filmmaking is uh, it's a great exercise in collaboration and how to work with a crew, how to work with other, you know, your DP actors and all of that stuff. And I think of it as a, as a sort of, um, it's a great tool for, for making um, relationships, learning how to be a professional filmmaker. The days of you know, someone having a short at a festival and then that and getting picked up and getting a three feature deal from a studio are probably behind us, at least for the time being. Um, but I think of it as a great training ground and it's, it's, you know, you just learn how to make films if you make shorts. And I think between the two of us, we've probably made, you know, a couple dozen shorts either produced or, or written or, or directed. And that, that's just a good, it's just a great, great experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And would you say would you say that it, it it is there some sort of concrete you know threads that you know link your shorts to now you're doing features? Are there some things that you know you got a meeting or you networked or something that kind of connected the two? Um, well, you know, uh, kind of echoing what my Aaron had said, uh, you know, it was a real opportunity to practice and learn and experiment. And I think for both of us, it was the opportunity to start playing with ideas that were important to us and themes, you know, about identity and about culture. So a lot of the shorts that he and I worked on, uh, we did another short together called The Boundary um, that was about the internment of Muslim, or sorry, the uh, interrogation and holding of Muslim Americans after 9-11. These were all things that, you know, were sort of centered around issue, issues that were important to us. Uh, so uh, it's the case that those short films were really a stepping stone to our features, not just in terms of learning the technical and craft-based elements of filmmaking, but also learning about what we wanted to say and what we wanted to explore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And maybe you can just give us briefly kind of a rundown of, okay, so you guys go out and you shoot a short, then what do you do with it to promote it? Film festivals, do you send it to agents? You know, you, you send emails to agents with a link to the film. Just run us through some of your sort of process of promoting your shorts. I find that, that the great thing about shorts now with, you know, from funding them through Kickstarter or Indiegogo and then, you know, getting them on the internet through various mechanisms is that they're a great tool for building an audience. And if you build an audience, you know, of people who, who care about the, you and your work, then you can bring them with you when you go to make your feature film. Um, so I think it's a super useful, you know, much more than sort of sending it to someone in the industry uh, is to connect with fans, to connect with people mm -hmm. passionate about the same things that you care about. And those people really have supported us um, in everything that we've done since then. And every filmmaker that I work with who, you know, if I produce a short for them, has built like a really great audience that they're going to be able to use on their next film um, to get it out there. Okay, okay. And and what do you do to build that audience? You're talking about just putting it on YouTube and, you know, sending the link to your friends and hoping that they pass it on to their friends? I, I think it's important to be really strategic about it, right? It's just like when you're writing, whether, when you're writing a short or, or a feature, to figure out who is the audience for this film and how can I start cultivating them, you know, even before we've shot a single 
frame of film. Um, so crowdsourcing is one great way. Like I, I, I produced a short which is about demolition derby drivers. And we reached out to just people from the demolition derby community. We made a little documentary about that world as a kind of a promotional tool. And you know, that's like a it's like a neat little subculture, but the people who are in it are really passionate about it. And then they got on board to, you know, crowd crowd crowdfunding the the financing of the short itself. And now that it's out there on the internet, like they're still sharing it a couple of years later, we get 50 or more new fans on Facebook and Twitter a month for this little short that's played, you know, a lot of festivals, but mm -hmm. really great for the filmmaker because if she wants to go make a feature in this world or reach out and explore other worlds, it's a really good opportunity. So I think it's about being strategic and finding the audiences as opposed to just throwing it on YouTube or throwing it on Facebook and hoping someone takes attention. And Julius is also super good at being strategic about his shorts and, and you can maybe talk about the one that you made on the cell phone which I think is a really good sort of free things going viral yeah I had an opportunity to make a short on the cell phone in Poland and uh, you know that actually was also somewhat influential on the girls in trouble um, in terms of just the style of a non-chronological story and uh, using voiceover and a much looser camera um, and, uh, you know, everything my Aaron said, there's so many great opportunities now to build communities around your shorts. I had another short that, uh, I put on Vimeo and from there it got picked up by a website called short of a week, the short of the week. And, you know, that short has now seen upwards of, I think 45 or 50,000 views. Um, so, you know, not only is it a place where the movie lives, the next time I have a short or, uh, or film I want to put out, there, there's an audience that, that, that is aware of some of what I've done. And, uh, you know, I go into meetings sometimes with actors or with agents, and they go online and look me up, and then they see that work as well. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, just like my Aaron said, finding ways to target a community of people who support your work and letting that live somewhere online, it becomes a, a meeting point in the future for, for what you're doing. Um, and the web has become such a great utility for that. Yeah, yeah, very, very smart. Those are some some excellent tips. Okay, so let's dive into your latest film, The Girl Is in Trouble, starring Columbus Short and Wilmer Vadalarama um, from that 70s show. Maybe to start out, you guys can just give us a quick pitch of the story. You know, basically, what's the log line in case our, our viewers have not seen the trailer yet? Uh, you know, the, the, the film is, uh, is a film war uh, that is set in the Lower East Side of New York, and it focuses on Columbus's character, who is a failed DJ who also works as a bartender, and he comes across a woman who is uh, kind of a femme fatale, who's a singer from Sweden, and she's witnessed the crime, and together she and Columbus's character conspire to use evidence that they've got from from her after she taped uh, a murder on a cell phone, uh, use it to blackmail the son of uh, a, a billionaire in New York who's involved in the financial industry. And uh, this murder that's happened actually is uh, the brother of a character played by Wilmer Valderrama, who's a drug dealer. So what ends up happening is these four people's lives and their histories are intertwined as they try and one-up each other and, uh, you know, either get the money or exact revenge. And uh, the Lower East Side is kind of the fifth major character in our film. And we take you through the history of the Lower East Side and how uh, different immigrant groups have informed that history and also how our characters are reflective of uh, uh, the history of immigration of the Lower East Side and, and really the history of our country in America. Hmm. Okay. Okay. That's a great pitch. So are you guys, um, big fans of, of film noir? Um, what were some of your influences with this film? I think a big one was Buell Jaffin films, uh, The Naked City and also Rafifi and the other films that he did, uh, once he went back to Europe. Um, Kiss Me Deadly is another great, great noir. There's so many, I think in, in general, like, any movie that is sort of um, about these desperate people in desperate circumstances uh, has been a good influence on this kind of story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tell me a little. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Joyce. 
Yeah, I think Up on South Street was another really seminal movie for us. Uh, you know, Mayur and I both love that genre, that era of film, and, and the fact that a lot of the noirs uh, of the 30s and 40s, uh, these were films being made by immigrant filmmakers, you know, people fleeing from Europe and the uh, Lumen World War II or, or post-World War II as well, and they brought an outsider aesthetic and mentality into how they made their films in, in America, and that was something really attractive for for two guys who are immigrants ourselves in, in my urine mm-hmm. and, and me. Yeah, yeah. I'm curious what kind of a reception you got with the script in terms of being film noir. I've actually written a bunch of film noir scripts myself, and one of the things I always get is kind of like, you know, film noir is a little bit passe. There hasn't been like a big hit. Um, Like when L.A. Confidential came out, everyone said it was a great movie, but it didn't do any business. And I mean, ever since then, it just seems like people kind of want to steer away from film noir from a marketing standpoint most filmmakers love it but from a marketing standpoint and did you get any pushback um a lot of my film noir scripts like i've kind of retooled them and now they're kind of like you know sexy thrillers or something instead of like you know film noir but did you get any pushback just from the financiers or people that you know potentially were going to buy this script um no not really just because our script was you know really written and designed to be a small film um, you know, it's a low budget film, so we, we we wrote it in such a way that it actually became more attractive to financiers who felt they could uh, support something that had genre elements to it uh, that was also an affordable investment. And then on top of that, we worked really hard to make art more uh, feel as contemporary as possible, just in terms of the way the story is structured, some of the elements of how characters are connected to each other. You know, it, it, it's it's a very of the moment and present tense script. And we also didn't want to, we were influenced by the spirit of the noirs we love, but we weren't trying to do homage or anything like that. So it gave us the opportunity to kind of, again, take some of the archetypes, but really do it in a way that didn't feel too self-conscious. So it seemed mm-hmm. overtly like a noir, but instead it felt like a modern story where you saw some of these archetypes in a different context. Wilmer's character is kind of our detective. Columbus is our man in over our head. A female lead, uh, played by Alicia, is our is our femme fatale, and then Jesse Spencer is uh, is our heavy. Uh, but none of those characters play those roles in in the typical ways you 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 might envision from a classic noir. There's a very modern spin to all of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Let's talk a little bit about your writing process. Um, I've written a bunch of scripts with other people, and I'm always curious to just hear how other writers, um, you know, collaborate. What does your writing process look like? Are the both of you guys sitting in the same room, spitballing ideas, one person's at the keyboard? Just describe kind of how you got went about writing this script. Well, we we started, you know, we spent most of the time together sort of um, outlining the whole film coming up with all of the beats, the character arcs, and all of that stuff. And um, then we would take turns working on scenes. So, you know, he would do a pass, I would do a pass. Um, Most, you know, sometimes we're side by side. Uh, Sometimes, you know, he was in L.A. or I was, you know, uptown and he was downtown. But, you know, a lot of it is just sort of sharing and being pretty open to, like, have you know, when your ideas, when you put your ideas on the page and you're working in collaboration, it's a, it's a collaboration. And so we learn not to be precious about anything um, and to really be open and listen to your partner because, you know, you're working together because you trust that person's instinct and because you, you care about that person's vision. And so it, it's, it's nice to collaborate with another person. Mm-hmm. Maybe you can talk a little bit about... Um Okay, so you guys have written this script. What was kind of your first steps to actually go out and, you know, raise the money, get this thing sold and get this thing made? What was sort of your your first steps and how did it ultimately come to pass that this movie did get produced? Well, well the first step was was really Spike Lee, who is the executive producer of this film. And he um uh Julius was at NYU at the time in the film in the film program and Spike is one of the uh, creative chairs of the program there and so we took the script to him Spike read it and he liked it and and then we decided to be sort of ballsy and we were like well if you like it so much why don't you uh, help us get it made and you know attach yourself as an executive producer 
And he was like, okay, make these changes and come back next week. He didn't say yes. You know, he just said, make these changes and come back next week. And this went on for almost two months. We would meet with him on, on a Thursday. We would rewrite over the weekend and give it to him on a Monday and meet with him on a Thursday. And he would give us notes and help us kind of, you know, nuance the script. And then he was like, okay, now how are you going to make it? I need to see a budget and a schedule. So we did that. We took that to him. And, and the next week we're, you know, meeting with, you know, he, he has a sit down with his agent and with some other people. And we start kind of getting the ball rolling on making this movie. Um, our producers on the film uh, were, the, were the folks that we'd worked with on our previous shorts. And so they came on and they really helped us also, you know, raise the funding for the film. And it's all through private equity and individuals. Um, and so between Spike and, you know, some really hard work of the producers, we were able to kind of put the movie together. Yeah, yeah. And I'm curious, so Spike Lee is the executive producer. What exactly does that mean? I mean, you just said, okay, he gave you notes, so that's obviously, you know, incredibly valuable, you know, a seasoned filmmaker giving you, you know, really specific notes on your script. So I can definitely see that he introduced you to the agent, but it sounds like then you were able to raise the money through your own contacts. So, you know, what what else did he do as executive producer, and what does that actually mean? Well, he also helped us close that money. You know, the interest that mm-hmm. came from some of our financiers was the fact that they liked the script. They liked my urine and I and had faith in the team that we were putting together. But, you know, it was really critical for a lot of these people to be able to meet Spike and know that he was also going to be helping uh, oversee the process and that their money would be spent responsibly. So uh, mm-hmm. some of our larger investors sat down with Spike and, you know, talked to him about the film. Uh, some of our sales reps as well were in contact with Spike. Um, you know, so the b- business of the film was built around um, Spike's incredible experience and success as an independent film director, producer, and writer and his mentorship of us and overseeing the project. So, you know, he truly was our executive producer because we would not have been able to raise that money and uh, secure the trust and faith of our financiers without Spike being on board. Yeah, yeah, okay. And tell me, when did distribution come into this equation? Did you start to get some distributors involved? Again, obviously having Spike Lee attached to the project um, as executive producer, I'm sure he could introduce you to people and help with that. But just give us a little overview of sort of when the distribution comes in with a film like this. Well, we were very fortunate. We um, The film played at, a, at the Brooklyn Academy of Music last year, at a festival uh, for new voices in black cinema. And it was sort of a, kind of like a preview festival of works in, you know, that have just come out and haven't really, you know, launched on the theatrical circuit. And our, our distributor saw the film there and they loved the audience reaction and they came on board. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. So it really was through through a, through a festival. Um, how can people see us? Maybe you can kind of tell us the um, release schedule. When is the movie going to be released? Um, are you guys going to do a, a theatrical release, and then when will it come out on Netflix and video on demand and that kind of stuff? The movie premiered April 3rd today. Um, okay. Theaters in New York City and on iTunes and VOD across the country. So it's available right now on iTunes. Amazon, Xbox, almost every cable platform, Direct TV, uh, you name it, people can watch it now. And, you know, the stars are Wilmer and Columbus and Jesse and Alicia are, you know, kind of full court press on the, uh, on the Twitter, social media world, uh, really getting the world out there. So there's been some, um, we've gotten great reviews and, you know, people can see it right away. Perfect, perfect. Um, I always like to sort of end the interviews. Can you guys just tell us, you know, how can people follow you and, and potentially contact you? Maybe give your Twitter handle, Facebook page, or a blog, email, whatever you feel comfortable sharing. Uh, my Twitter handle is at MyurinTiru, and my website is MyurinTiru.com. So folks can follow me there. My, my production company is Dodgeville Films, and we make a lot of independent films and documentaries, so... I can send you those links. Yeah, yeah. That, actually, that would be very good. Um, I, I will link to those in the show notes. So, um, yeah, um, send, definitely send me those links. And what about you, Julius? Are you on Twitter or Facebook? You know, I'm 
I'm I'm one of those guys who has not. Yet <laughs> Don't be embarrassed. There's definitely a band, band, bandwagon. Uh, but really you know, a fan if, of mystery. <laughs> but uh, at the same time, through my urine, my my dear friend, if anybody uh, anxiously wants to meet me, uh, that that's a way to do it. Uh, 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 that 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 would be a good way to go. Okay, perfect, perfect. As I said, I will get those links from my urn, and I will link to those in the show notes. Um, I, I would applaud you guys. As I said, I love film noir. I thought this was a really great film. Um, I totally enjoyed it, so I wish you the best of luck with it. Um, thank you very much for coming on and, and talking with me today. Thank you so much, Ashley. It was a real treat to be here with you and talk to you. Thank you very much. A quick plug for my email and fax blast service. I'm running a special right now where you can purchase one third of the blast for a little more than $50. The total list is around 6,000 contacts. So this first one third is still well over 2000 contacts. So it's still a very large number of producers. I've done this just to lower the barrier to entry so that people can check out the blast service without having to invest a whole lot of money up front. The one thing that hasn't changed, I still require that you join S way select, which at the time of this recording is just 24 dollars per month. The reason I require this as part of the process is that I'm going to personally look at your log line and career letter and help you make them as good as possible. This will be to everyone's benefit. It will keep the list working well. All of these people can unsubscribe if they don't like the query letters that they're getting. So obviously the better the query letter is, the more likely they are to not unsubscribe. Also, I have a lot of experience submitting cold query letters. As I said, I'm going to look at your query letter. I'm going to look at your logline and I'm going to help you. So your response rate will be hopefully better with having me actually look at it. So the one third blast plus one month of SYS select is just $78. And that's a, that's a blast again to more than 2000 industry producers. It's really never going to get any cheaper than that. So if you've ever wanted to, to give this service a try now is the time. Anyway, to check this out, go to selling your screenplay.com slash blast. In the next episode of the podcast, I'm going to be interviewing Kane Sens, who recently wrote and directed a film called Echo, oh, Echoes of War, a post-Civil War drama starring William Forsyth and James Badge Dale. It's an interesting film. It's a period piece, and Kane is actually Australian, even though this is, is as I said, takes place in the post-Civil War era. So we talk a great length about how he got this film made and what attracted him to this material. So keep an eye out for that episode next week. To wrap things up, I just want to touch on something from today's interview with Julius and Myern. I'm a big proponent of doing shorts as a good first step in a screenwriting career. I think the template they're laying out for themselves is exactly the reason why. I also want to call attention to something that Myern talked about, about how they got some of them funding for some of the shorts that they did. Really listen to what he's saying. They found some small niches that had a passionate community of people and then made a film for those passionate people. There are tons of these type of sm types of small communities of people out there. Everything from people who own a specific, a very obscure type of pet to people who are interested in some very unique, obscure sport. You name it, there are people out there who are interested in these small niche things. And with the internet, it's never been easy, easier to find these types of communities. Usually these communities have leaders or people that are sort of, you know, at the forefront of this niche. And the key is to connect with those people because those people will be able to kind of get you in touch with all the other people in the community. If you can befriend one of the leaders of these community, that can really help guide the entire community towards your project. And this isn't just about, this isn't just a one side relationship where you contact someone and ask them how, the, how they can help you. You've got to make it a win-win for everyone involved. It can't just be about you and how they can help you. If you really think hard too, you might already be involved in a community like this. Think about your hobbies, think about your interests and see if there isn't some sort of community around that hobby or interest and get involved more with that community. But in any event, if you can tap into a passionate group of people, those are exactly the sorts of people who are quite likely to support a Kickstarter starter campaign and donate money. So it's a fine line. You've got to find a community that's small enough that it's underserved. There's not bigger players trying to serve that community, but it's got to be big enough. So it's got to be small and niche enough that they feel a real sense of passion and, and a real sense of ownership of whatever that niche is. But by the same token, it's got to be big enough that they can actually support a Film. So it's a fine line and you've got to really think about what your film's going to be about and how it's going to serve this community. 
And this can work too. This can work all the way up from shorts, as Myron mentioned, all the way up to feature films as well. A script I wrote a few years ago is currently optioned to a producer who is essentially trying to execute something very similar to what I just outlined. It's a baseball comedy, and most of the film takes place at one minor league ballpark. So what we're doing is, is we're approaching minor league baseball teams and telling them that we'll rewrite the script to perfectly suit their team. We'll incorporate their mascot. We'll incorporate their colors. We'll incorporate their stadium. We'll re literally rewrite the script to really incorporate the unique things about their minor league team. So this script will really be about them. And we're hoping that the team obviously will kick in some money. They can call it a marketing expense, whatever. We're hoping that they kick in money, but we're also hoping to tap into the loyal community that this minor league team has. And we'll try and run a Kickstarter campaign and we will, we will have this, this, hopefully this relationship with this minor league team and they can help us get in touch with all of these very, very passionate baseball fans that are very passionate about this minor league team. So it can be like a really cool thing. I mean, the idea here is, is we're going to create a really cool film specifically for these minor league fans. It's going to take place in their stadium. We'll probably use a lot of them as extras. So it'll just be a real community type of a film. And we're hoping that by getting the, um, the first step is getting the minor league team involved. And we're hoping by getting them involved, we're doing exactly what I just outlined we're getting the leader of this passionate community of people we're getting the leadership which is the minor league team involved and then hopefully they're going to help us you know get the rest of the community involved and, and and supporting this film and ultimately hopefully supporting a kickstarter campaign for it so that's the idea anyways um, i'll definitely keep you guys updated um, as this thing progresses but hopefully you can just see some potential in what I'm talking about for yourself and, and, and really listening to what my Aaron, you don't have to start with a feature film, start with a very small short and go out there, connect with a community and see if you can't do a Kickstarter campaign. The great thing about shorts in this day and age, I mean, $2,000, $3,000 can, can easily produce quite a nice short film and it's not that difficult to find a community. I mean, that's only like a hundred people, you know, giving 30 bucks and you got $3,000. So it's not a huge, you don't need a huge community of people to support this, to actually make it work. Anyway, that's the show. Thank you for listening.